Bill Stewart. I'm a Wayne County Conservation Supervisor and also Chairman of Guyan Conservation District. If our Conservation District consists of six counties. It's Wayne, Cattle, Lincoln, Mingo, Wayne, and Boone. Logan. Logan. I'm sorry. Here we go. I'm getting six counties. If I get seven, I'm all right. But uh, one of the things that uh, I wanted to talk to you about is the fact that make sure you're signed in, get a ticket. But on the back of my truck out there is the chair that will be given away. And then I believe there's two uh, 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 nice baskets of flowers or something. I haven't seen those, but yeah, they're here somewhere. Yeah, they're hanging on the tent. Ronnie here, standing beside of me, has been great in hosting and uh, letting us come to his farm and helping us set up and do the work that it takes to uh, uh, have the meeting here. We'll have a, an awful lot of people speaking today, and you'll have people here that will have a group session that want to talk about high tunnels. There are people that own them. So they'll be asking, you can ask the questions and talk with them and what your interests are, and they'll be doing that for you. With that, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Corinne Powell. She's the uh, NRCS. Uh, that means she's national, does a great job, and, and uh, she's really responsible for putting this thing together so we can be here to talk with you today. Corinne? All right. Thank you, Bill. Um, I'm the... Uh, District conservationist for those six counties that Bill uh, just mentioned there, Cabell, Wayne, Lincoln, Logan, Mingo, Boone. Uh, I'd like to thank Ronnie Hager and his family for having us out here today. They've done an awful lot of work. I don't know if anybody's ever had a field day or an event at their property, but it takes uh, almost a whole community to try to put one of these things together. So I'm very thankful that he's willing to have you all out. Uh, he's okay with people being in the high tunnel, but please, please try to walk lightly through there and after we finish our program and we get lunch going Ronnie will be available to answer questions about things that, that are going on uh, in his high tunnel and, and things like that. Um, just some you know uh, things to know the bathroom is right back there there's a porta john it's handicapped there's also a hand washing state uh, station I know we're just coming out of COVID so wash your hands and let's try to be safe. Um, there's coffee behind me in the shed, as well as some coolers with water and some drinks. So if you like some coffee or need a drink of water, feel free to help yourself. Um, have several speakers that we're going to have. I wish I had an agenda printed out, but the week ran away with me. Um, but then we're going to have a round table where if, uh, we're going to have some uh, experienced high tunnel growers come up and talk about what they have to go on. And like, and like Bill said, we are going to have an auction here. So. I'd like to go ahead and start and introduce my uh, first uh, speaker here. This is Barbara Liedel. She's from West Virginia State University. She is a tomato expert, so if you are into tomatoes, she is the lady to talk to. She's going to talk about succession planting, which if you're growing a high tunnel, you have endless possibilities of what you can grow in that high tunnel. And so Barbara's going to try to give you some pointers on how to do it and make the biggest bang for your buck. So, Barb, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, ma'am. All right, can you hear me in the back? All right, we'll see how this works. I've worked in the theater. I'm not used to using microphones. Okay, so as Corinne said, my name's Barbara Liedel. I work at West Virginia State University in there. <coughs> um, besides being the tomato lady um, in there, I breed tomatoes for greenhouse and high tunnel production. And just so you know, for some of you who known me for a while. Um, I'm probably next year going to be looking for people that want to trial a line or two of mine. So, fingers crossed. They're in the greenhouse right now. We're harvesting. We've got one line in particular we're really excited about. So, we'll see. So, stay tuned. And if I am looking for anybody, I'll let Corinne know so that she can get it out to all of you. Um, besides doing the work I do on tomatoes, um, in there I also am involved in integrated pest management. I do a lot of work with beneficials in there, so I'm very excited to hear what Evan has to say. Good morning. 
um, in there. I'm also part of the West Virginia Food Safety Training Team, so if you're ever interested in getting training for produce safety, please let me know. Uh, more than happy to see if we can't pull the team together and do a training in there. We also do writing your farm food safety in there. So, um, got all of that. What else am I involved in? Oh, I'm also the Northeast SARE um, Professional Development Coordinator for West Virginia State. So there's a bunch of SARE publications I brought in there. If you've got any questions, SARE will have uh, grant programs available, one in particular this fall uh, that is open for growers. You can put in a small application for up to $15,000. You can see examples of it and be more than happy to work with anybody on that. We like to see West Virginia farmers get their fair share of those pots of money, and SARE grants are some of the easiest to actually fill out and get in there. So um, be more than happy to talk with you about that and, and growing anything else. As I keep telling people, I can teach you how to grow anything in there. It's whether or not you can actually sell it. That's the more important part. So when Corinne asked about succession planning, I was excited, and then I was terrified, because I've never done a talk on this topic, though I believe firmly in it for a variety of reasons in there. So we're going to go over some basics about succession planning and some general ideas about it. Your handout has all of my slides, so you will not be missing anything. And on the very last page is also a list of websites um, that I really liked. Also some links to books, and I'm not giving these five books out, but I brought five of the books that I have listed there, so if you want to take a look to see if you're really interested in any of them, I have those with me um, in there. And then the last thing on that list is a link to Growing for Market. It's a, I hate to call it a newsletter, it's not exactly a magazine, it's somewhere in between. Anyhow. Um, it used to be run by Lynn Besnicki, who's known for her cut flower work, but it's now done by Andrew Medford. He's in Maine. It's a really great thing. It's all totally geared by growers. It is not ag service providers writing for them. It is growers writing for other growers in there. So they have um, example articles available. If you want to see any old versions, let me know, because I actually subscribe to it. So. Um, so just know that that's another thing on the list. All right, so my IT lady, would you please take <coughs> me to the next slide? This is nice, I get, I get uh, personalized treatment. All right, so we're gonna start off with some definitions of what su succession planting is. And really the simple one is, it's basically growing two or more crops in succession in the same place. That's a little narrow, we're gonna widen that out a piece. You also might think of this as intercropping, and just so that we're on, can separate the two out. Intercropping is gonna be growing a fast crop in the same location at the same time as a slower maturing one. So if you grow maybe lettuce underneath your tomato transplants in there, your lettuce will be harvested and out before your tomatoes are really ready to be harvested. So you can grow two crops in the space of one. For all of you who, like me, learned about the three sisters where you put in the corn, the beans, and the squash in the same hole, classic example of intercropping. So kind of gave you an example up top with succession where they've pulled out a crop. You can see some in the back of it getting ready to put a new one in. And down below, that's uh, brassica in with some lettuce on there. All right, next slide, Mike. So why would you want to do succession planting? Um, whether you're in a high tunnel or outside, you want to do this um, to get a consistent supply. Especially if you're growing this for a market, but heck, even if you're growing this for your own family, you want to have that consistency. You don't want to go, oh, we don't have any tomatoes today. What am I going to do? So you also want to do it to avoid planting too much or too little. Um, you want to fill in any gaps, especially if you have a high tunnel. High tunnel real estate is, the most ex is more expensive than field. So you want to maximize all the use of that high tunnel space. So you don't want to leave any little 
nooks and crannies unplanted in there. Um, some crops, though, I will say this, you really don't want to necessarily plant more than once. I'll give you one example is indeterminate tomatoes, though I'll have an example later where you could grow it twice, so just hang tight. But indeterminate tomatoes in a high tunnel, you're generally putting them in, and you grow them for a number of months. It's unlike the determinate tomatoes that grow up to a certain height, set all their flowers, set all their fruit, and basically they're done and you need to pull them out. So it kind of depends. So if it's a long-term crop, you're probably going to want to leave it in there and it's not as amenable to succession planting. But there are some crops that you really need to have several plantings for to get that continuous supply. Lettuce, carrots, radish, and for any of you who can, <coughs> dill. Because you know that once you plant your dill and you've got it to do, my favorite, dilly green beans, you know, the dill does not regrow. You need to have that succession of that to have good, nice dill flowers to be able to use. All right, so that's why we want to do this. All right, so we're going to look at four, there are more, but four general kind of plans on how you can think of doing successions. We're going to talk about different crops, same spot, different time in there. So maybe you start with having lettuce and you move to tomatoes. We're going to talk about same crop, different spot, different time in there. I'll give examples. I give pictures. We're also going to talk about same crop, same spot, but different maturity dates so that you can get it over a wider range. And last but not least, different crop, same spot, different maturity dates, and that's really our intercropping example. All right, next picture, thank you. Ooh. All right, so this is that first one where we're gonna do what would be kind of what I consider that traditional succession planting, where you plant something in the spring, then it's done, pull it out, put it something in for the summer, pull it out, put something in for fall in there. And so you basically maximize your harvest by putting in, having a plan to plant all three of those crops in there. So that's our first, that's the traditional. Next one. This is going to be succession planting where you basically plant the same crop, but you plant it at different times. So if you planted all your lettuce at once, all of it's going to mature at once. And how many people are going to eat all that salad? Are you going to be able to sell all that salad? Remember, horticultural crops are highly perishable. So it's not like you can sit there and say, look, you guys, you grew well. Hang tight. Give me another week. I'll come back and harvest you. It's not going to happen. So that's why you've got to think ahead in there. And so the whole idea of that you plant things, especially things like lettuce, one option you'll see a couple is you plant it like every two weeks. You plant another part of your lettuce so that you have it mature over different times. So that's the second version of succession planting. All right, next. So here's that intercropping example where I've got radishes planted in with carrots because radishes will be pulled will be mature and out of there before your carrots will, and so you'll have the space for them. There's lots of things you can do intercropping-wise. So, and last but not least, I think I got one more. There it is. This is the different maturity rates, and I'm sorry you can't really see the picture, but this is three different varieties of sweet corn. I know it's not in a high tunnel. I couldn't find any good pictures, but let me just tell you this. If any of you do anything where you plant at least two different varieties of the same thing at the same time in your high tunnel, I want a picture so that I can use it. I will give you photo credit. But this is um, three varieties of sweet corn, bodacious, candy corn, and silver queen that were all sown at the, on the same day, and they will get over two weeks of harvest. So you can see one here. Here's the second, and then down there is the third. So what they're doing by doing this is, they made it easy on themselves that they're doing one planting, 
but by having three different varieties, they're maximizing out over what length of time. Because if they had done that all with one variety, they'd all have to harvest all of that at one time. And how many of you are a one or a two person operation? Yeah, you gotta work harder, um, smarter, not harder. We gotta quit with this part, working harder in there. And let me just point out, when I came to state, I inherited a project where they worked it out so that um, we had potatoes, tomatoes, and sweet corn. My potatoes had to come out of the field just when the tomatoes were coming into harvest. And it wasn't just a question of I went in and harvested. This was a research. So we had to take data. And this was the middle of July. And I only had so much student labor. And I nearly killed them the first two summers. And I turned to my boss who wrote the grant and is a wonderful plant physiologist but doesn't do production to save his life. And I said, we can't do this anymore. This is wrong. We're not using our time wisely. And I'm having all of this come in at the same time. So I changed the whole production system. We threw out the sweet corn because I'm from Indiana. I may not like growing <coughs> agronomic crops, but I do know how to grow corn. And they were growing it in single rows, six feet away. We never saw an ear of corn. It was sad. So we threw that out. We also threw out, um, we changed some things in there. So we put broccoli in instead of the corn. We kept the tomatoes. I'm trying to remember what our last one was. So we had three different crops. That made it that I'd have the broccoli out before the tomatoes came in. I'd have the tomatoes and we put a second crop of broccoli in and do a fall one in there. It made it so much easier. I did not kill my staff for me. So having that whole idea of succession is not just a question of maximizing that. It's also maximizing and not killing you and whoever else is helping you in there. And by the way, I'm still in touch with those students that worked with me then. That was 20 years ago. If any of you, do any of you know Chris Postelay? Okay. You would remember if you knew him. He's six foot seven. So anyhow, he'll tell you stories about that, those two summers. All right, so next slide, please. So one of the ways to start with this, and I put this link on there. This is from University of Kentucky. Um, they actually have some high tunnel plans in terms of when you could be um, both either direct seeding or transplanting and then harvesting different crops in a high tunnel. They have three different maps depending on where you're located. I kind of took a guess at what I thought was closest to us in there and this is what I put up for region two in there. So this gives you an idea of kind of what a general map would be for a single crop. Because then you can start to build what you're going to have when in the same space in your high tunnel in there. And you can pick and choose from this, which I thought was handy. Plus, also, if you want to adjust it, they give you the minimum air temperature in your high tunnel and your optimal temperatures. So if you keep records, which I highly recommend because it allows you to figure out what works best and then be able to transfer it to the next year and do some planning, um, this really helps out. Now this is just looking at single crops and a lot of it what Kentucky grows, we might grow. Next one. Then what you want to do is, so you figure out kind of how yours would fit in with that and figure out your first, your earliest spring planting date. How early can you actually get in your high tunnel and grow something you care about? I'm willing to bet, because I've been at this in West Virginia over 20 years, I bet you everybody has at least some tomatoes in their high tunnel. Or is somebody going to prove me wrong? Nope, they didn't. Yes. Um, so figure out how early. About how early can you put your tomatoes in your high tunnel? April 1st. Anybody different? And that's transplants going in, right, Paul? 
Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's probably about right. I usually have talked about maybe the last week of March, but not much earlier, and especially when we get weird years like this year. So that's going to be how as early as you could put something in your high tunnel. Now, you cannot use what's outside because that's longer. Because how soon do you put your tomatoes outside? May 10th or 11th here. Anybody else got anything different? For me, I never put tomatoes outside when we were doing field trials until usually after May 20th. And the reason for me is I actually have lived in the state when there was frost on the ground, like May 25th. So I've learned. I don't, I don't push that one in there. So bear in mind, I grew up in the Midwest and was educated in the upper Midwest. So um, Others depend, some crops, depending on how you manage your high tunnel, will depend on your last frost date or when your, your tunnel's going to get cool in there. The big thing is don't plant too early. I should have added don't plant too late. Because there is a point that if you plant and you're going to grow stuff over the winter, that if you plant too late, that the plant won't have enough light to actually be able to establish itself that you can harvest off of it for any portion of time over the winter. We'll come back to that. All right, then one of the things you can also do is Johnny Seed has a last worthwhile planting date calculator in there. And I'll show you an example of that. But that can give you some ideas about when you could plant something with the idea of it growing and also maturing that you can get harvests off of. Because what's the point of planting something when it's not going to mature or be by the time your tunnel's too cold? You can also count backwards from your first frost date in there, depending on how slow or fast something grows. So there's a couple of ways around this. All right, Madam IT. So here's an example of found this, and I think I put the link in there as well. This is a Frontier Woman. And I really liked her because what she ended up doing is she's got a plant in here that looks kind of like that Kentucky plant, but what she's done is overlapped different crops. So if you look just at that top line, she's showing her last frost-free date. She's got beets in here that she started early in January. She's in a warmer place than us. Um, then she's got zucchini. She's going to harvest her zucchini. And then she's going to put some spinach in in the end. Do you see how she's maximized out that whole bed? By looking at the crops, when they'd go in, when she'd harvest them, and when she'd take them out and put something else in. And she gives you a whole bunch of different ideas of what she's doing. You can look at this as an example and then modify it according to what you've got and your dates. And some of the books I brought will give you some examples and we're going to run through a couple so you can do it. And you don't have to be someone like me who loves things, grafting things. This is, this is my jam, my catnip. All right, so this is an example of how somebody's doing succession planting and really maximizing it out. She can also visually have an idea of what she's going to be harvesting when. So if any of you are doing something like CSAs or you're trying to plan for promoting at farmer's markets, you'll have an idea. All right, Madam IT, thank you. This is that spreadsheet up at Johnny's to make it work for you. And they go through and do a very good job of education. You put in your last frost-free date put in your varieties, the days to maturity based on the seed package, and then what intervals between successions. They give you some examples in there, and then they populate it all out, which is a handy way to get an idea. Now, I'll tell you, the whole idea of doing eight plantings of something, in my mind, is nuts. Look at, especially even for lettuce, probably no more than five or six, unless, you know, you somehow found a whole family or a community of rabbits in there that you can 
you know, sell all of that too, and they just really love your lettuce better than anybody else's. But that's an example, and that's also on the link in is in the website list. All right, next man. Here's another one. This is called the rough plan in there. And uh, if you are interested, of course, it's the last book on my pile. Pam Dawling, who's over in Virginia um, and has written a couple of books, this one's great. And she really goes through the whole idea of a couple of different plannings. And her rough plan is that you figure out what you're going to grow, basically, um, are you going to direct seed it? Or are you going to transplant it? In there, is it in your greenhouse? Is it in the field? And then you kind of say, I'm going to do succession planting every two weeks on it or every three weeks in there and kind of just have a rough plan. This is as much planning as you do. Don't worry, there's an even easier version coming. So this you can kind of plan out from that. All right, your next one, this one, for those of you who know Terry Hudson, this would be Terry's, the no paperwork method in there. This one, you do things kind of by what you see. So for sweet corn, you would plant the next one when the previous crop is about one to two inches tall in there. And that'll give you about enough difference in planting that you won't have them come in mature at the same time. Or you grow plant more lettuce when the previous one is already germinated, because lettuce is really quick. Another example would be, so more beans when your previous beans are straightening from the hooked to the straight. So this you're kind of working on this based on how the plant looks and kind of you know the feel of your crops and when, you know, you'll get a difference between them. And people have been doing this one for hundreds of years, so. All right, next one. Um, so, if you're gonna look over this and try any succession planning, I'm always um, cautionary to everyone is don't go in whole log and try and do everything all at once because trust me, you will fail. Been there, done that, learn from me. Um, start small and start first with whatever major crops you're going to grow. So, tomatoes. Everybody grows tomatoes. Everybody grows half runners, right? Except for a few of you. I heard somebody today is growing bush beans. <laughs> Makes my little Midwestern heart happy. Um, so start with those and figure out, can you do succession planting with them or not? If you're growing indeterminates in your high tunnel over the summer, probably not. You could intercrop early on with them and put some lettuce or something at the bottom, but you're probably not going to be able to succession plant because you're going to establish that crop early in March and run it through into the fall. We'll come back to that. But do stuff like that. If you're going to put in something like bush beans, once they've finished, you should have a plan of when they're going to come into when you sell them, when they're going to start maturing, how long you'll get a crop off of them and rip them out. Put something else in. Don't leave the ground uncovered. Then look for more space within your rotational plan. So if you put in beans and normally you don't put anything in after like August and you kind of leave the ground bare, what else could you plant? What else could you sell that time of the year or what else can you convince your family to eat? Have you tried Asian greens? They're actually really lovely. It's not something I grew up eating. But there are some options, and there may be markets for that. So look at some of those minor crops that you haven't maybe grown before and try those. Um, or divide up your major crops into succession categories. So how many of you plant all your tomatoes at the same time? I used to. I don't anymore. And I do that because, again, I killed myself and my staff. When we used to plant everything in my house, that was over 500 tomato plants. And we tried to do it in one day. It, uh, also then, everything started to come into production at the same time and us take data on it. So we now stagger the, 
planting the seed, transplanting them, so that we do kill ourselves in terms of taking the data and dealing with the plants. It is much easier. Of course, it's only taken me close to 20 years to figure that out. Um, also, don't forget about adding cover crops. Um, I went through college and talking about things like cover crops was not something they talked about. We tangentially got mentioned about IPM, but nothing for real production. It was for home gardening, more or less. Um, I will never put a crop in out in the field without having cover crops. If there is bare ground, it is only because I just tilled it and I'm waiting to put the seed down. And the reason being is I can put organic matter back in the soil with that cover crop. I can add nutrients to the soil, especially if I do a legume in there. I can reduce erosion and the loss of any soil in there. And my favorite, and this is the main reason I do it, I'm lazy. I hate weeds. And it cuts down on the weeding issues like no tomorrow. It is worth everything. So please, I know you're not harvesting a cover crop in succession, but consider it. And I'll come back to that. I will give you an example. All right, next one, ma'am. So some crops to consider for succession planting. Things like beets, broccoli, cabbage, carrots, collards, kale, spinach, in the spring and again in the fall. Some of those can do well over the summer, others will definitely not. Anybody tried to grow head lettuce in their high tunnel over the summer? How fast does that bolt? <laughs> yeah. Um, other things you could also consider are beans, edamame. Anybody here grow edamame? Do you have any clue what edamame is? I've had to clue my dad and stepmom. That's edible soybean. And that actually is wonderfully nutritious and it would again be another one of these minor crops. But it's again in the bean family. So if you already know how to grow beans, you know how to grow edamame. You just have to learn when to harvest in there. And if you need any input on that, one of my former grad students is working in an edamame research project down at Virginia Tech. So I'll be glad to hook you up with them. Um, also, determinate tomatoes. Because again, if you grow the determinants, which is most of the current varieties, not the heirlooms, they will grow to a certain height, set all their flowers, set all their fruit, and they're done. They will not really produce anything else again. It's pain in the butt if you're trying to grow it in a high tunnel or a greenhouse, which is why everything I produce are indeterminate types. Um, squash, sweet corn, really good if you sow a couple of times. You know, how many of you have had the zucchini glut? Yeah, my mom didn't appreciate that at all. Um, some other ones to consider, especially over winter, and we'll come back to that. Lettuce, spinach, turnips, radish, scallions, tetsoy, which is another Asian, um, and some other of the Asian greens. Did you know you could actually grow stuff in your high tunnel and harvest it over the winter? I'll come back. All right, IT lady. Thank you. Um, don't plant, so some real cautions in there. Don't plant vegetables from the same family in succession. So if you're going to grow broccoli, don't grow another brassica. Grow something like a bean after it. And that, that's because you're going to be inherently more at risk for getting diseases or pests because they've already found that you grew broccoli there. And all the brassicas have pretty much the same diseases and pests. So changing it up with a different crop helps. Use things, if you're going to grow stuff in your high tunnel in the spring to go into the summer, start with growing varieties that are heat resistant. Because then they'll do, or at least heat tolerant, that they'll do a lot better in there going into the summer. And then do vice versa if you plant in, say, August to go into the fall, plant things that are going to be more cold resistant or cold tolerant in there so that you can actually have them in there longer. 
All right, next. All right, but um, those of you who have heard me speak before, I am, I am not an ag economist. Um, I never wanted to be. That was the one class that I burned the books of notes in, took economics in undergrad. It was awful. Um, <clears throat> whatever you're choosing to grow, make sure you're growing it and you're planning the succession based on how you're going to sell it or use it. Because you know your family does not want the glut of tomatoes where they have to can all of them right when the fair is happening. Bad timing in there. Um, <coughs> and just because you grow it doesn't mean you can sell it. So really have a plan. Even when you're planning your succession, you really should think about where are you selling this? Who wants it? Because that may open up some of those markets to you if you grow some of those minor crops or even try them out. And it may open you to a whole new group that you could sell to that you hadn't considered before. <clears throat> also consider what else is in production. So remember I've been telling you I've got some exceptions. Um, I work with a group up in Philippi, it's a husband and wife team, um, the Sicklers, and the Sicklers have uh, greenhouses, high tunnels, and field operation um, in there. And they don't grow anything in their high tunnels during the summer at all. They have cover crops in there to improve their soil. They have the sides rolled up, the ends rolled up, and that's what they put in there during the summer. <coughs> what they do grow in their high tunnel is they establish stuff in the fall to go through the winter. And they harvest out of their high tunnels in the winter all their lettuces, Asian greens, things like scallions, etc. that we talked about, because they found that nobody in Morgantown Farmer's Market has anything like that to sell. So they have found a niche. The other reason that they don't plant anything in their high tunnel in the summer is they have all their fields where they have their tomatoes, etc. And they can't work both. They do hire in some help, but again, they can't just hire <coughs> indiscriminately, they, you've got to have experienced labor, but more importantly, can they afford it? So they made the decision to narrow it down. You're probably waiting to find out what they do in their greenhouses. Their greenhouse operation is mostly, not entirely, for the spring. They grow transplants, annuals, Mother's Day's baskets, etc. Then in the fall, they'll have mums and some other things for that. So basically in the summer, they're not trying to operate those greenhouses because they can only cool them so much. And they don't grow in them during the winter because the cost of the energy to do it is too much. Which is why they use their high tunnel. They'll use some road covers it gets cold. Because Philippi is way up north compared to you guys in there. So just putting that out there. Don't necessarily just embrace their model but consider it where they've taken and throw this whole succession idea on its head. And they're putting their cover crop in in the summer, so they're improving their high tunnel ground during the summer, not the winter. It works for them, they've been doing it for several years. Last one, high tunnel greenhouses, or high tunnel tomatoes. I've been saying this for years. I don't think I've yet gotten anybody to try this. I'm not sure why, but I'm going to try again. All right. If you have both tomatoes that you grow in your high tunnel and in your field, and even if you don't grow them out in the field, how many of you have battled trying to keep your tomato plants in production and not having diseases or pests during the height of the summer? Okay, Paul's trying to raise his hand and he's got a thing on it. So let me just share with you this. I'm a tomato breeder. We try and get out of my greenhouse in the summer because I can't, there's a certain point at which the flowers won't set because it's too hot, it'll kill the pollen. Truth. Um, and it also kills my staff 
to be in there, and it's just not worth it. Plus, I need to have, for myself, since I grow the same crop in my greenhouse every year, I need to have a clean break between them so that we clean the entire house out. It helps with my disease and pest problems. So, what do I recommend for high tunnel growers? Especially if you're growing, especially indeterminates, don't try and grow them from March until November. Here's what I suggest. Put your transplants in in March, <coughs> grow them, harvest them. The minute tomatoes start ripening in the field, rip all your tomato plants out of your high tunnel. Harvest all the ripe fruit and all the green fruit. And sell both. Because this is one of those regions of the country you can sell both. And what grower is going to rip green tomatoes off their field plants to sell at the market. You will get people coming because they want to buy those green tomatoes. Because they don't normally get green tomatoes in May, June. Then, put in a quick cover crop. Something like buckwheat in there, just to keep your soil covered in your high town. Start new transplants. Put them in in August or early September. Grow those tomatoes for the fall. Because by that time, the field crops are starting to go out when you're start to mature. And you haven't killed yourself trying to keep those plants suckered back and taken care of and enough airflow through during the height of the summer. And you'll have healthier plants going into the fall. Then when it gets too cold, rip those plants out. <coughs> take off the red and the green and sell both. It should be about Thanksgiving time. And you know everybody wants fried green tomatoes on their Thanksgiving table. So then put another cover crop through to make you through until March. See my thought process? It really helps out not just on production and on your health in the high tunnel, but it really cuts down on pests and diseases. It allows you to grow different varieties at different times in there. Just a thought in there. So if anybody ever takes me up on that, I want to hear your experience. Um, I can't do it. I don't have a high tunnel. Um, I still think it makes sense in there. All right, <coughs> last one. So in summary. Succession planning is going to allow for that continuous supply of produce through the season. Whatever you define your season as, because you realize you could, if you planned right, you could harvest 12 months a year out of your high tunnel. Start simple with major crop plantings and then fill in gaps in there. Remember to rotate your crops, consider nutrient depletion, and putting cover crops in your Plants. And by nutrient depletion, I mean not only the NPK, but also organic matter. And then keep records of your seeding, planting, and harvest dates so that you can fine tune this in the future. Now, you do not need to have some fang crazy fangled scientific thing to take your data on. Get one of those hard sided black and white composition books you can pick up at the Dollar Tree. And use one of those. Or just write it on a spare piece of paper in there and have a place that you put it, like when they do orders at the um, restaurant, put it on there so you can go back through and pull everything off for one year. Make it easy so that you'll do that and keep those records so that you can use them the next year. All right, last but not least, I got to put the plug in. Um, this is. I'm funded by a whole variety of things, but I just chose these out. Funding from Northeast SARE, also funding from USDA NIFA in there. I am part of the uh, West Virginia IPM team. It's me and a bunch of guys and Mira from WVU that are involved in that. So I do integrated pest management work for high tunnels and greenhouses in there. And if you're ever interested, talk with me on it. My greenhouse. We're going on eight years of using beneficials. We have not sprayed in my greenhouse in eight years. We clean it out once a year, clean it out really good with some one really tough chemical, but other than that, we have not sprayed with anything. 
and I grow tomatoes every single year. So, anyhow, thanks for your time. I'm going to stick around at least until I get to have Dorothy's lunch in there and uh, be happy to answer any questions you've got. Thanks. Thanks, Barbara. Um, like she, uh, Barbara said, she will be uh, around for a while. Um, and if you're looking for resources about planting dates, um, our NRCS office, as well as our next guest speaker here, will be able to help you uh, find some of those online, reliable online sources. I know there's a lot of things on YouTube, and we get asked a lot of questions about things on YouTube. But um, we'll try to help direct you into a reliable source for information. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to identify, I think I have all the district board members kind of close by, so if I don't, I may have to identify a few more. Um, so the district board, if you're not familiar with who they are, the Conservation District Board, they help the uh, NRCS office, which is uh, the federal office, and also the state West Virginia Conservation Agency, set local priorities for the people in their community. They are elected officials, you will see them on your ballot, and they help guide what the farmers need. So if you know one of these folks, or if you'd like to meet one of these folks, uh, this is an opportunity to let them know what problems you're having, what needs your community have, um, not only just farmers, but landowners. There's all sorts of different aspects of the natural environment that they uh, help provide technical support and some financial support as well. So we have Johnny Ball in Boone County. Johnny, raise your hand there. And uh, George Mathis in Logan. And then, of course, Bill Stewart is our Wayne County Supervisor and Chairman. Uh, there in the back, uh, we have Helen Stanley from Mingo. And then Ronnie Hager himself is on the board for Lincoln ha County, and he's back there in the back as well. Um, if you're interested in serving in the board, on the board, there are elections that come by every four years and we're always looking for some new voices for the board um, and people that like to serve because it's not, it's not a good paying job, I'll be honest with you. But if you do want to help your community out, uh, it is a good path, a path to do that and, and we work really well with the district board. They provided uh, most of the financing for this today as well as the Office of Emergency Services. Uh, Francis Holton is here. He's uh, supplied signs that flashed about the field day, so we, we thank that office and Francis for helping us out on that. Um, so I guess I'm ready. Are we ready, Evan? Okay. So Evan Wilson is the yeah, Ag Extension Agent, uh, West Virginia Ag Extension Agent for Cabell Wayne. Is that correct? Yes. He is available to help other counties, or we can find you the Ag Extension Agent that helps you. Uh, he's actually my neighbor, so if you can't catch him, let me know, and I'll drop in his house. But um, he's going to talk about pests, and I will tell you right now, the first thing, that if you're new to high tunnels, you don't even know what's going to hit you next, okay? Because it's going to be a whole different story uh, of what you're going to see in there and when you're going to see it. So, Evan, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, neighbor. <laughs> As she said, I am Evan Wilson. I am the WVU Extension Agent for Ag and Natural Resources in Wayne and Cabell Counties. And I am the lone ag agent for the Guy and Conservation District County. So if your soil tests come to the county, they generally come to my email as well. If you all have questions about the fertilizer recommendations, give me a call. We'll work through them. Um, for those that don't know, our office in Cabell, because that's generally the closest one for Lincoln County people to get to, is now in Milton at the old Milton High School back in the, the old choir room. If you know where that's at, about behind um, the area where they had the corn maze. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to talk about IPM or integrated pest management in our high tunnels. Now this can be, now, now I'm kind of uh, um, got stage fright here from Dr. Little because this is her expertise. So if I'm wrong, You're do fine. tell me, tell me what I'm doing wrong here. So what is IPM? Okay, this is from the USDA. This is their definition for IPM. It's a, a sustainable approach to managing pests by combining biological, cultural, physical, and chemical tools in a way that minimizes economic, health, and environmental risk. So it's a broad spectrum way to control our pests in the best way possible for us to have the healthiest crops we do have. On the right side of the screen, you do see what we call the IPM triangle. And what does this mean? Has anybody saw this before, this triangle? 
One. Okay. So, for those that have most of you all didn't raise your hand. So when you this is what we call the IPM triangle. I said you have the pathogen on one point, susceptible host, and then you have a favorable environment for this disease or for this disease or insect to be in your hot tunnel in your garden. That triangle has to have all three sides together. If you remove the favorable environment, that triangle falls apart and that disease or that pathogen should go away. Or if you're susceptible host, so if you're planting plants that are resistant to powdery mildew, you that's your removing the susceptible host, you shouldn't have the powdery mildew problem. Thank you. Next slide. Okay, so the most common insect pests that I do get called out for in our area in high tunnels are aphids, white flies, mites, hornworm, cucumber beetle. Some flea beetle, slug, and cabbage looper. And next slide. Okay, so the aphid, I was going to provide like a list of all the plants these animals do cover, but we'd be here for another three days if I was to talk about all the plants for aphids alone. There's over 500 host plants that these plant these insects do attack. They are very tiny. Most of these, most of these insects are going to be very tiny, microscopic, almost microscopic. You might need some eyeglasses or a hand lens to see them better. And they do come in a wide variety of colors. I've seen white, green, yellow, and orange, and red. What they do when they do, they have a piercing, sucking mouth part. So when they go to a leaf, this is a tomato leaf I took from University of Florida. They pierce and they suck the, I think it's the chlorophyll from the leaves, and that opens that plant up to your other diseases and bacteria that can come in there and wipe out that plant later. There are biological controls that are effective. Lady beetles, especially the young larvae. Stage lady beetle, they'll go in there and just destroy those. You can go online and find videos of those lady beetle larvae just destroying aphids. They love them. Assassin bugs or wheel bugs, those have a, stat, a piercing mouth tube. They'll go in and pierce them and kill them. Lace wings, and then the chemical controls are insecticidal soaps and oils. What the insecticidal soaps and oils do, my understanding, is they actually kind of prevent the aphid or the insect from actually sucking the chlorophyll out of that plant. And then if you're looking for a little bit stronger than the soaps and oils, you're looking for active ingredients by by phytherin and pythrins in those products. There are a bunch of insect killers you can buy at the local hardware store. Just make sure that your your insect is listed on that product so you're not applying the wrong one. And make sure you're looking at the proper timings on that as well. And okay, the next one is white fly. These are going to be very tiny white dots, dashes. On the, generally on the underside of the leaf. The best way to control these or best way to identify what they are are the sticky traps. There are two types of sticky traps you can buy that I'm aware of. There's a blue and a, and a yellow. The blue and the yellow, they attract different insects based on the pheromone that's on the product. So I believe it's the blue one you want for the white flies. Is it yellow? Yellow. Blue for spider mites only. Blue for spider mites only. Okay. Sticky traps for those. That way you can get up and see what they actually are. And you may catch some other insects on those too so you can get ahead of those. And that is the main point of this whole presentation is you gotta get ahead of the game. You can't wait until it's too late because then you're in your high tunnel or your garden, you're like, well, now I've got slugs. And you're, you're wiped out slugs or hornworms. And then insecticidal soaps and horticultural oils are the uh, prefer, preferred method of control for white flies. And there are over 250 host plants for these insects as well. What they'll do is they'll have, I think they have a piercing sucking mouth part too, they'll come in and just destroy these leaves. You'll, your leaves will start to turn black and curl up and die on you. The next is the spider mite. So mechanical control kind of is high pressure water that just knocks them off, knocks them out of the, out of the leaves. And then the biological control, we back to those lady beetles. There are a huge list of lady beetles that will attack most of these insects. And predatory mites, not the, spy, not the spider mites, but predatory mites, you can order some of these and bring those eggs in if you don't have them already. Again, the same products that we've talked about for the aphids will work for these as well. They're very tiny. These are a two-spotted spider mite. And if you don't, if you can't identify them, give me a call, send me a picture, and I'll be happy to help figure out what's going on in your high tunnel. Next slide, please. Hornworms. When was it? December 2020, I think it was, I was out at a high tunnel out Swamp Branch Road, and it was out Dells, and I was look, look, looking through there, I'm like, wait, there's a tomato hornworm. It was December. Had a bunch of white, had a bunch of these parasitic wasp eggs on there. These is a 
most of your hornworms will you'll start to see these on there. These are eggs from parasitic wasp you can actually order to introduce into your into your high tunnel if you don't already have them. Most of our garden supply catalogs have them. And but hornworms can attack primarily your tomatoes, but they can attack your potatoes, peppers, eggplants as well. And what they'll do is they'll come in and chew your leaves up, or also they'll come into your tomatoes and eat the fruit right off the vine before you can get to it. I know some people like fried green tomatoes, they just like raw green tomatoes, so you got to watch out for that. And really the best way to control them is just to hand pick them and throw them in soapy water. They're big, they're larger, and if you spray them with water as you're going down through there, they kind of raise that spike on the rear of them, and that way you can see them a little bit better. And then cucumber beetles, there are primarily two species of cucumber beetles you need to watch out for, the spotted and the striped. They will attack your cucurbits, so your squashes, watermelons, cantaloupes, cucumbers. And when they do start to feed on the, and skeletonize that leaf, they can actually carry bacterial wilt and introduce that into your crop as well. So that's really where you got to watch out for these things. If you start to find two beetles per plant, or over two beetles per plant, on 25% of your plants in the cotyledal stage, so the very young stage of that plant growth, that's when you need to start applying pesticides. That is what we call your threshold of importance to get into and start wiping those things out. There's a wide range that can impact cucumber beetles in the way you want to. You can start with the neems, pythrins, pythrins, carburetal. There's a lot of them you can go with. And what they'll do is they'll just go ahead and skeletonize these leaves. And that's you, your leaf is a solar panel. So it's trying to collect that sunlight, bring it in there to, cook, to turn into chlorophyll so your plant has the energy and the food reserves to produce that cucumber, that squash you're looking for. Next is the flea beetle. So flea beetles are very, as I said, very tiny, black, metallic looking insects. They'll go through and they'll chew through those leaves. And the best way to get ahead of them is to have some row covers. And sometimes you have to do a floating row cover on your larger plants to get it off the leaf themselves so you don't have a frost damage in the spring. Yep, and you got to keep away the weeds too because they'll hide in those weeds and come up underneath your row cover. Cultural controls are trap crops that are radish. And sometimes the trap crops will work on the other insects as well. You plant their preferred plant earlier and they'll attract to that kind of like we do a tree of heaven for sp uh, spotted lanternfly. You put, put that plant out there, let them attack that, then you come and throw some heavy on that plant and wipe them out. Another way to do this is plant later. Just plant out of the, when they start to hatch generally. That way you kind of avoid that whole range of you larvae and pupa. And then remove those hideout areas. Anything that they can get under, make sure you can hide them, get rid of it. Mulch, debris, old plants from last year, mulch, as I said. Make sure you try to get that out of there so it doesn't, it doesn't provide a habitat that they like. There's a wide range for these that will work on these as well. And they'll, they'll about do the same damage that the last one did, the cucumber beetle. But they'll go through here and they'll just eat. Eat and eat and eat. <coughs> Slugs. Slugs is a common one I have more in backyard gardens than I do in high tunnels. But the best way to do that is avoid overwatering because those slugs do like that moist, damp environment. You want to try to use your drip irrigation to keep that moisture close to that root system and not around. If you have any rocks around your high tunnel, you may want to move those out because they'll hide underneath those as well or logs. And prune those lower leaves. Those lower leaves will create a microhabitat that allows that humidity to build up underneath of that, especially tomato plants I've seen a lot. And that also opens up the bacterial well and other diseases you don't want in your high tunnel system. And you just want to print those out. That way it doesn't provide a moist, humid environment for those slugs to uh, propagate in. Hand pick and soak. Throw them in soapy water and let them go. And then I've heard beer traps. I haven't tried it. So if you have some beer traps work. But you have to put it into the soil so they slide right in. Okay, so you have to put a pitfall trap. Yep. So dig a hole, your red solo cup, whatever you got. Pour some. Do they have a beer preference? Nope. No beer preference. The better, Cheaper the better. Yeah, yeah that's probably true. Smellier. Smellier. See, that little skunk beer, throw, pour that in there. Dig, dig your hole, put it in there, pour it in there, and let it, let it crawl in, and see what else you catch. You might find some other interesting insects you didn't know you had. Science project for 
Science project. There we go. There, we could we could do a taste testing. You can see if they have different preferences of beers or age of beer or. You put beer in the high tunnel, you're going to trap me. <laughs> I'm not coming out. <laughs> New beer garden. Oh. <laughs> the next one is cabbage loopers. Um, they have a wide range of plants. They mainly target our cabbage plants. They will attack um, Brussels sprouts or the lady out by Beach Fork I saw two years ago. She had a nice thing of Brussels sprouts and they, they came through there pretty much overnight and wiped her out. Insecticide, you're going to look for that BT or soaps and oils. The BT is a preferred method of wiping these things out. And these are additional resources and links. Our printer, we've been trying to get ink, but the China plant that the ink comes from burn up, I guess. So we can't get ink right now. But I have y'all's emails. When I get back to the office this week, I'll email y'all the presentation to you so that way you can go back and do it. And I'll have my contact information there as well. And Corinne mentioned a planting guide or when to plant. If y'all signed in back there, we had a stack of our garden calendars from this year. I know it is now May the 14th, but it is still time to start planning. We've got plenty of growing season left, especially if you think about getting a high tunnel later this year. There are recommended varieties for the back of it as well. For West Virginia. Different colors, different varieties that may work better for you in our environment and what we have going on. Are there any questions? Um, Evan probably doesn't remember this, but there is an IPM Chronicles that comes out from WVU, and um, all of us on the IPM team write for it, and since Evan will have your email list, I will make sure that gets forwarded so you can get that. That comes out four times a year, it's done electronically, and that covers everything on there, so we'd love to add to that list, especially with everybody here. Yep, and I'll also see if I can be on the list too for our summer weekly, I think it's weekly, bi-weekly, some of our Zoom calls we have with our with our pest management specialists. That way they can give us more up-to-date advice of what they're seeing. Like last fall we saw it's every, two every two weeks. That's what I thought. That's starting up here next week or two, like soon. Congratulations. Well, thanks for letting me know. I appreciate it. I'll pay you, you in the email. Thank you. <laughs> but... And those are recorded, our IPM stuff is kind of hard to find on our website sometimes. Like last fall, we had fall armyworm that came in. If your all's grasses started to die out front, just turn brown, that was probably the fall armyworm. We had a pretty rapid response on that going um, pretty quickly. So, if you have any questions, give me a call, or I'll be here today. Let me reiterate something else you just said. Um, you guys need to know you are very lucky to have Evan. Um, I work with him, and if he cannot figure out what you've got as a disease or an insect in your high tunnel or anywhere else out on your operation, he gets a hold of the rest of us and asks for help. So um, please do not hesitate. That's something we provide statewide in there. And you've got Evan who has a direct contact and has, n has no shame in using it. <laughs> no, I'm not an expert in everything yet. I'm trying to be, but I'm not. And then I should have just um, added this resource. We have a plant diagnostic lab in Morgantown as well. So your plants start to have a disease showing up or mildew you're not really able to identify. Sometimes being able to identify that particular disease or pathogen you're seeing is the best bet before you go out there and spray the wrong stuff. Because if you saw what prices of products is right now, you spray the wrong stuff out there, you're wasting your money. You might as well just be spraying water on it and some fairy foo-foo dust in it. But, it's like our soil oil submission form, but it's for plant diagnostics. It's on our website as well. That's, a, I think, an under, underutilized resource we do provide to West Virginians. Very much so. Okay, does anybody else have any specific questions uh, for Evan? I know there's a lot of questions out there. Now, Evan, I, I was teasing about getting a hold of him, but he did answer a text <coughs> from me on his day off. So, uh, it's pretty good. Um, now, I do want to tell you, I failed to mention this earlier, you can see a couple cameras here. They are only broadcasting speakers, okay? Now, if someone approaches you about being on camera, they'll get your permission first. So don't feel like you're going to be anywhere. Armstrong Cable is graciously uh, recording this so that folks that cannot be there can watch it um, from their home. So we appreciate that. Thank you for coming here today to do that for us. Um, my next speaker is uh, Tom Baston. He is also with WVU Extension. I worked with Tom a long time. He's talking about something that's 
really near and dear to my heart. A lot of times uh, folks can't figure out what's going on with their soil or with their plants, with their plants, and a lot of times it falls back to what's going on with their soil. So um, WVU has an extensive lab, and he, Tom's going to talk more about that. Um, and he'll be around. I know that I talked to Ray about some questions he had about this asparagus. So if you have some specific questions, Tom's the guy for uh, nutrient management. He's uh, an expert in the state. So I'm, I'm thankful that he's here today. He drove, uh, came in last night. So thanks, Tom. We have a I had no idea that we would have uh, okay, that's fine. this much technology um, on, on this sort of uh, event. Um, so I have handouts, and um, so I would like to say greetings from Morgantown. Um, it's great to be in this part of the state, and uh, it's just you know I'm I'm excited. Uh, I came down with a colleague, uh, Jody Carpenter, and he'll speak next. And we, you know, our eyes were just so wide open. I mean. We've never seen this many catawba trees in bloom um, in our in our in our lives. I mean, we just don't have that kind of glory up in the northern part of the state. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people sort of um, have have attitudes about different places, but you've got you've got a great place down here, and and don't be shy about it. Um, so. Let me, let me go back a couple years. Um, for many years, we had uh, a very old uh, soil testing uh, lab method and how we did our business. And uh, about five years ago, we decided, you know what, we're going to modernize. And we went through a lot of committee meetings and sort of argu arguing amongst ourselves. And, and out the back end popped... A, a new soil test method, um, new crop codes, um, a new new submission forms, and a new method that gave us more information. And and luckily, we're still providing a free service. So the only thing that we ask you to do is to take a good sample, um, get it in good shape, dry it. Uh, air dry it before you ship it because you don't want to ship water and then you know um, fill out the form correctly so that we can give you good information back okay and if you're a high total producer um, do it every year because you know the only way for you to plan forward is be able to look backwards and say I was here, and then this next year I was here, and then I was here, and so then I know where I want to go in the coming year. Otherwise, if you do it like every four or fifth year, you can have dramatic changes um, and get yourself into trouble. And I think that from a standpoint of high tunnel production, I'm I'm a high tunnel producer. This is my third year, and I, uh, I, I took a, an old sheep shed, and I tore it down, and I took that soil, and I piled it up, and I built myself a nice pad, and then I had my operator come and scoop and drop that topsoil back on the, the pad area, and so I had good fertile soil, um, but you know, more is more, right? Fertility is always better when you have more. Um, no, it, it, it really isn't. And uh, so even me, who, who, you know, has a focus in fertility, um, I even have now found, and we will look at my soil test from my high tunnel area, and, and we'll go through each part of it and I'll describe how I've sort of moved the needle higher than it needs to be. And it's easy to do when you're in a small area and you're trying to maximize and get as much out of that growing area as you can. So 
let's let's uh, let's grab the first handout, and and that's the soil test uh, soil test form. Has everybody seen a WVU soil test form? And and how comfortable are you with with reading the results? Are, are you are you pretty comfortable? So. At the top, it says it says lab test results, and 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 uh, um, I I always put my square footage down so that um, that's my reference for making any sort of applications. I do I do applications um, on my beds, and if and I have two and a half foot beds. Thank you, ma'am. I have two and a half foot beds. They're 60 feet long, and so those are my treatable areas. And I, I only figure out what my fertility that I want on a per bed, per bed basis. Because if you do it for, let's say you have eight beds in your 30 foot by 72 foot, and you, you say, okay, well, um, let's, let's say you need five pounds of, of uh, of lime over those eight beds, and five pounds of lime is like, you know, it's like half a half a bucket, and so you've got to do all those eight beds, right? You get halfway through, and you, you're already used all of the material. It's so much better to like divide it up and treat one bed at a time, and that way you can't make that mistake across the whole thing. You can. You may make a mistake and get three quarters of the way through one bed, but then you're only over applying, um, you know, on that on that smaller area. So so treatment is is you know take your time with making your applications um, in your high tunnel. And there's a really good um, website with University of Georgia. It's called. Um, it's a it's a fertilizer website, and, and uh, I'll I'll give that to Evan, and and he can share that with you. So let's let's go through this soil test result, okay? So the first thing that I tell people to look for every time is soil pH, and why is that? Soil pH, it, we call it the master variable, and it affects. Everything it affects microbial um, activity and microbial life. So if you want good soil health, you want those those um, soil biota to be healthy and to be thriving. And so they need to um, be in a pH range where they're happy and where they function, where they take organic matter and eat it and con convert it into usable nutrients for the plants. And, and, you know, if the pH is too high or likewise too low, then your available nutrients, for, well, your microbial life on either, either parts, high pH or low pH, are both effective. But chemically, if you get pHs above 7, 7.5, 7, you have all kinds of um, needed nutrients that really start to become less available to the plant. And so if, if you have a pH of 7.5 in your high tunnel and you're growing um, the normal range of crops that Barbara discussed previously, you need to add sulfur to your soil. And you need to do it in a, in a really um, managed way. You don't want to overdo it. You don't want to underdo it. So there's another really good website that I like. It's a fact sheet out of Purdue University, and it's a horticultural um, uh, fact sheet on lowering soil pH for horticultural crops. Because what do we do? We love our soils to death, and we line them whether they need lime or not, and we get ourselves into trouble. So that's the first 
That is your first thing that you want to look at in your soil test. Where's my pH? Am I in the sweet range? You know, um, you know, we're we're good anywhere from six to seven. And when we start getting out of those areas of the soil pH range, start to think about um, adding um, sulfur or um, or liming if you're in the low low pH area. Okay, let's go through the macronutrients. So, do you notice that there's something missing from this whole soil test um, result? There's no there's no nitrogen listed. Why? I mean, that's isn't that our main um, nutritional need? I mean, we like to eat protein, right? I mean, we like beans and and hamburgers and stuff like well plants like nitrogen too They're, it's unless you're a legume and you can produce your own nitrogen um, you have to feed nitrogen to your to your tomatoes and your peppers but we don't list it on our on our soil test why is that it's hit and miss it's there it's gone it's pulled into the body of a microbial um, entity, it's, uh, it's, it transforms all the time. It's a sneaky little element. And, and so um, we, don't, we don't analyze for it because if it was there when you pulled the sample, it could be gone in two weeks after that when you want to, to make, the, make the decision on what you use. So we use sort of like where the plant is in its life cycle and what the plant's nitrogen nutritional needs over either extended or they will break up nitrogen recommendations over the growth period of the plant. You can, so, you know, how many people do a full season nitrogen application before they put their transplants in? That's an option. Or you can put in half of your nitrogen needs, let your plants grow for about 60 70 days, and then you can put nitrogen in through your drip irrigation to, to, to feed that, that, that uh, reproductive or that fruiting component of your plant life cycle. So nitrogen's not, not listed, boo-hoo, too bad. You know, that's much more, it's a very much of a, of a knowledge-based um, <coughs> sort of um, requirement on your part to know how to, to manage that nutrient. P and K, phosphorus and potassium, are the other two what we call macronutrients. And they are very much um, a part of production. Uh, potassium is very important with fruiting. Um, phosphorus is, is important through the whole life cycle. And, and if you look back, um, historically, soil testing um, became a, a, a national push because our soils were all deficient in phosphorus. And so we, you know, that's been our major push over the last 80 to 100 years was to, 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 to get phosphorus um, into our soils. And so, you know, here, here's, here's Tom's soil. Phosphorus, my value is 170. Um, it's about um, five or six times past the optimum. So what did I do? Um, I, I kind of like buying this stuff called mushroom compost. And uh, it, it's a nice organic um, amendment. There's no weeds in it. Um, but boy, does it have some nutrients in it. It's got a lot of nitrogen, has a lot of phosphorus. Um, it's made with poultry litter, is a component of mushroom compost. Um, and so I, I had, you know, I, I should show you my previous soil test. My, my phosphorus levels were not like this, but I just did a couple, um, sort of bed treatments of, of uh, mushroom compost and really pumped up the volume. So, so what's, my, what's my, my ongoing move now? 
no more phosphorus for these beds, for this high tunnel area, okay? Same way with potassium. I'm way over on potassium. Um, and, and, and it can be, it can be an issue. The other, the other part, um, I, I did pay for organic matter, um, and I did pay for EC, and somehow it didn't show on, on this report. I'm not sure why. Um, but those are right next to the soil pH. And Jody is going to talk to you about electrical conductivity, and I'll talk to you about soil organic matter, because it is by far our most important input for our mineral soils in West Virginia. Remember, we're not a prairie state with, you know, four foot of topsoil. We have topsoil that is at most four to six inches, and, and you're in a good spot when you have that. So, you know, we are always on the um, sort of the push to add organic matter. And organic matter does so many um, things for you, but it doesn't have to be a nutrient heavy organic matter addition. Uh, as, as Barbara stated, uh, you can do you can do cover crops. Um, and, and so that's a, a way of adding organic matter uh, to your system. But you can also do how many people how many people compost? Is there any composters? Yeah, that's great. So you know the thing is, you you can you can do a slow compost, and and and, and, and it's it's a it's a yard waste based compost. So there's manure based composts, and those are very nutrient dense. And if you have a soil test like mine, you don't need those kind of composts. You know, keep the don't don't buy that bag of uh, of of, of uh, compost or Manure-based compost to add nitrogen. Get get nitrogen sources from from like coffee grounds and, and other plant-based material to drive the composting process. I know this isn't a composting talk, but still, you know, mulches are a, are a real nice addition as well. To because even in a high tunnel, uh, they will they will break down, and um, you know, over time, I, I think mulching. Um, the, the soil surface with um, with organic mulches is nice because it cools the soil, it keeps the microbial activity um, happy, and it it, uh, it feeds the soil at the same time. So that's organic matter. Calcium and magnesium. Um, you, you can't really get into trouble with calcium. Um, other than elevating your soil pH, but that's more a function. Elevating soil pH is is uh, a function of you applying lime and having carbonates increase the soil pH. The calcium is just the after effect of the lime. So I'm not going to talk about magnesium because Jody's going to talk about magnesium because it has is a factor with EC. So it's another one of those things. I will say that, like everything else, people have a love affair with certain products. And, you know, just please put your Epsom salts away, OK? <laughs> they're cheap. They're cheap. They're organic, you know. But, you know, more is not always more, you know? More can be trouble. Um, Okay, so as you can see, we have two recommendations, and, and, and we have a, a sufficiency rate, and we have an optimum rate. And of course, with, with you know, my excessive love of my soils, all I have is a nitrogen recommendation, and what's my crop? Tomatoes, bare ground, fresh, and so they're giving it to me on a square foot basis, which is really nice for the lab to, to break it out that way. You want it on an acre basis, you just tell them, you know, up top in your submission form, I want, I want my recommendation on pounds per, uh, per 
the right, and they'll give it to you that way. What's this, what's this deal with sufficiency and optimum? Sufficiency is just plant removal. So you, what you put down, the, the, the harvested bull crop will take away. It's one of those things that we put in because people rent ground and they're not sure they're going to get it the next year. And so they only want to put fertilizer down for their current year because they don't know if they're going to be able to crop that area the next year. Optimum means that you're, you're in a, a, a medium or a low state in fertility and we'll give you a recommendation that starts to move you up closer to that optimum level. So it'll, it'll provide a, a, an amount of material that will not only feed the crop, but that will build fertility in the soil additionally. Okay? It's not, it's not rocket science. Um, let's go to the back end. Because I just, you know, I think notes are, you know, notes are, are really important and sometimes overlooked. What's the one on the top? It says, apply one to two pounds of boron per acre. Holy mackerel, how can you do that? That's like, let me get my eyedropper out and like walk around the high tunnel, okay? So this is a really hard one to apply. I mean, so calibration is so important and it's, it's so agonizing and it's so overlooked because it's just like, it just blows your mind. You're just like, okay, how do I put 0.33 to 0.66 ounces per 100 square feet? Yeah. Yeah. Eyedropper. Eyedropper, yeah. So, so, okay, so you take, you take, uh, so there is a product called Solubor. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. When you just dilute it in water so that way you get it thinned out? Right on. Excellent. So there's this product called Solubor. And you dilute the heck out of it. Okay? And you put it in your spray tank and you spray it across the whole bed. And you, and you, and you do it maybe like every three or four years. Okay? So boron is mobile. Okay? Boron is a micronutrient that's needed in tiny amounts. It, and we've only seen it uh, in a few crops. In the cold crops are susceptible, cabbages and stuff. We've only seen it, and we're not 100% sure that's, that's what it was. You know, and, but the thing is, is that um, we don't have a lot of leaching in high tunnels, unless you have a movable high tunnel like me. And, and my, my spot now is, has had some really good, decent rains over the last few weeks. And, and uh, so, so, but most people have stationary high tunnels. And so that migration of boron through the soil price profile is, is not that, is, is not typical as in an alfalfa field. So in, in alfalfa production, they, you buy a, a potash fertilizer that has a tiny amount of boron, and that's, a, that's usually a, an annual um, application because alfalfa is a big, big user of boron. They're, they're, it's, a, it's a real uh, needed thing. So last thing on this soil test. I have a question before you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the lab results don't show boron. How did you know you needed boron, or why is that it's, a recommendation? It's exactly like nitrogen. Okay. I mean, we, you can't, there's no, our analytical equipment is not sensitive enough to pull it out of a, uh, a soil sample. We're not even going to fake it. So we just give you a blanket re recommendation, just like nitrogen. So if I got soil test results that don't have boron showing, I wouldn't need it. If, if I've got a result back and it says you need this much nitrogen, but it doesn't mention boron. It should mention boron. If you pick a vegetable crop, it'll okay. mention boron. Okay. So the, the, the software, you know, says, oh, it's a vegetable crop. Throw in the boron note. Okay. All right. I mean, it's, 
So it's an automatic application every so many years, just like you figure it'll get yeah. leaked out over that much time. Yeah. So yeah. what's the recommendation? It's not confirmed. What's that? So what is the actual recommendation in the greenhouse? Well, you mean like like for a boron application? It, it's uh, 0.33 to 0.66 ounces per hundred square feet. Every so, so many years. Yeah, I mean, so that, so I, I'm saying that because you're in a protected, um, uh, you know, uh, culture with a with a plastic roof, and you don't have the, the the leaching potential like you would outside. This would be sort of an annual um, need in a in a field crop. You know, and the thing is, it's you know, soils matter. So if you're in a sandy soil, you know, the, my my pal who had a soil test lab down in. In, in Delaware on the eastern shore. I mean, he, he, he tested for boron. I mean, this, this guy was like, he had nerve, man. He would give you a boron recommendation. But that's a sandy soil where, where things leach readily, whereas we have much more, um, you know, textured soils with, with uh, silt and clay, so that boron moves much slower. Okay, last comment on the back page. What does it say? It says, you're an idiot. Your soil phosphorus <laughs> conditions are well above the level for environmental concern. Do not apply additional pea fertilizer. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's, it's, and so that's a function of this, this last thing on the first page that says PSAT, okay? And so that's phosphorus saturation. And so how do we come up with that? It's a really cool new test that we do. We, we can, we can pick out that phosphorus level in, in the soil sample you send. We can pick out iron, and we can pick out aluminum. And those are the two metals that marry up to phosphorus and hold it in, the, in, your, in your soil system. And it's like, you know what? There's only so many rooms at the motel. And once you've added enough phosphorus, there ain't nowhere for it to stick on the soil. And it starts to become mobile. So is it, a, is it a problem in high tunnels? No, because we have a plastic roof, so it can't be lost to the environment. Is it a problem over in poultry country? Everybody nod yes, because it is. Um, because after a while, the soils can't hold it. And so this is a really nice tool uh, to tell you, you know, what the ratio of your iron and aluminum and phosphorus are, and where you are on that that degree of phosphorus saturation. Okay. Let's do this one. This one's a real. This one's a quickie. How many of you have used the um, Moorfield field office? Manure analysis or water quality lab to send a compost sample to. It's a, it's, a free, it's a free service to the citizens of West Virginia. I've used it to test the protein and hay. Okay, so so this this is this is a animal manure analysis. This is a wet chemistry analysis. They they will give you a nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium result if you send them your compost or your animal manure that you've stockpiled. Um, and I think it's a really nice tool for when you've gotten elevated fertility and you want to just add material but you don't want to add a lot of nutrients and see what your, you know, what your compost is like. How much should I put on? I mean, more is not more, you know. So, um, again, go ahead. Uh, what do you do if you have a big compost pile of cow manure and rotted hay and stuff, yep. and a sent in a, a, a sample, and they said, don't put no more cow manure on this garden. But it's too late. What do you do when you got all that too much? Um, so, 
I mean, on the soil test, it said just, you know, lay off, you know, at least stop, you know, look for, look for, you know, start, start mulching. I mean, don't, don't, you, you have to look for other nitrogen sources because, you know, you know, I, I'm like you, I, I've got sheep that I feed in an area and then I go and I scrape up all that waste hay and that manure that they've accumulated and turn it and make a really nice compost. But I, you know what? I don't think I'm going to be able to put that in the high tunnel anymore. And they, and they sleep on it in the winter when it's cold. Yeah, sure. Yeah, bedded pack. You know, and so, um, but those are those are nutrient dense composts, and we have to find alternative places for those to go. You can't just keep um, applying. So, like, say you're kind of getting to maximum levels, which my gardens get pretty high. With just throwing a Manure crop, like a cover crop over the winter and tilling it in be pretty good. It would be fantastic. So last winter, I, I, I did a mix of um, daikon radishes, crimson clover, and, and cereal rye. And I just completely messed it up. I, you know, I was like, oh, wow, look at this. This daikon radish seed is so cool. And so I put like five times as much daikon radish seed oh. as the mix said. And I just got a climax <laughs> forest of daikon <laughs> radishes. Killed out every, um, you know, rye seed, every clover died. But I just had this beautiful, and they lasted, they lasted till like January till we finally had some really cold weather and they, they shriveled and died. But you know, when that died back, that had pulled all that nitrogen up into that taproot um, and, and left it on the, the soil surface. And then I had a, I had this marvelous weed feed, feed weed free area because there was not a winter weed that could uh, compete. So yeah, you know that's that's a good one. Uh, I love crimson clover. I think crimson clover is just um, I would make that. Big component uh, for for high high fertility vegetable areas. So, like, what time of year do you really need to get your cover crop like going? September? I don't know. It's, you know, climate change has just completely ruined our, our timing of everything. You know, I mean, we we didn't have a killing frost it, it, well into November uh, up in Morgantown. It was the craziest fall last year. Amen. It went on forever. You could you could have planted you know, cover crops in November and, and had success. But I mean, okay, so we've done, like down at uh, Alderson, there's a plant material center, and we did uh, t uh, planting timing of cover crops. And we did, um, you know, September 1, September 15, October, October 15. And, and by far the, you know, um, the, the, the September 15 to October 1 was, was, those were the best times. Those were, I mean, um, those those were as comparable to those real early when you're still cropping. So, you know, October is good. In a high tunnel, we did a cover crop program in, in high tunnels, and we did October and November plantings. And our November plantings were, were just as good as our October plantings, but we we used a row cover. And, but, boy, the biomass was tremendous. And then the, the neat thing is is that they, they developed so well during the winter that we could terminate them early. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the, other, the other piece of equipment that I think that we really need to start people thinking about is flail mowers. Because flail mowers will take a cover crop and then it'll, it'll shred it into like tiny little pieces and just lay it as a mat on the, on the surface of the soil. And, and uh, I mean, I, I finally got the boss to uh, let me approve to buy a flail mower for, for my uh, B, BCS. And it wasn't cheap. It was over $2,000. But, you know, it is, another, it is another good tool for high fertility soils. What's a flail mower? Huh? What's a flail mower? A flail mower has got a, has, has got a, um, a, a regular bar that has little chains 
with, a, with, with cutters on the end of the chains. And so it spins and it just cuts and cuts and cuts and cuts, recuts the plant material. much of your time and 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 so I'm gonna finish up with this one and so we're real tickled about um, us coming into the computer age and you being able to buy products um, online with a credit card <laughs> imagine that <laughs> you don't have to send a check to the soil test lab and wonder you know wonder where that'll end up <laughs> so we have an e-commerce store, and I, I just, I don't want to go into it, I don't want to give you blow by blows, but you can purchase three products. You can purchase electric conductivity, and I'm not stealing Jody's thunder, that's all I'm going to say about that. That's very important. You need to, you need to test that in your high tunnel more than, more than anything else. It's a very cheap, it's a very cheap uh, test. Uh, under five dollars, organic matter. Organic matter is is like is is very important. Again, I would I would for five bucks. It's a it's a cheap cheap and dirty organic matter method. But it gives you an indication and allows you to look at how you're improving your soils over time. And then we have another one. We have a, a micronutrient package, and I have. I have mixed feelings about it because I don't like to um, provide information without recommendations, and that's what we do. We give you we give you numbers, and then we don't tell you what those numbers mean. So it's like, I mean, people wanted it. You know, they wanted they wanted those micronutrients. So we we're like, okay, you want them, and and so we don't really have a good uh, way to interpret the results. Okay, so. Um, Grain of thought on that one, but with that, um, I, I really appreciate. You know, I'm not as I'm not as cool as as, as Lewis Jet, and you know, so I'm like I'm like this stand-in, and you know, you know, he apologizes to, to Johnny for not being able to come down, and, and he said that I could take a beating from Johnny in, in, in his stead. So, uh, uh, but I really appreciate coming down. And, you know, this is, so I've got 37 years in with WVU, and, and uh, um, that's enough. Um, <laughs> next year, I am done. So at least I can check off and say I came and did an educational program in Lincoln County. One, one's better than none, okay? But, you know, you have my information, you got my cell phone number on that soil test result. So if you've got fertility questions, I don't care. I, I've, I've been known to pick up my phone, so you know. Um, and I'm still, you know, I'm still a public servant for the next 11 months. <laughs> I got a quick question. Yeah. I uh, used to put down a lot of uh, uh, soil sludge in my hay fields. Yeah. And about six or eight years ago, I stockpiled about 15 or 20 ton of it. And it's been in a pile since then, and, and it's dried out, it's really dry. Would that be something good to put in a high tunnel or not? No, okay. absolutely not. Because you're, you're consuming the product. I mean, even There's multiple reasons about not putting that in. I mean, number one, um, you may be good about what you flush down a toilet, but <laughs> well, oh, someone over here, <laughs> you know, so there's that. And then there's, there's other there's other chemistry that ends up in wastewater treatment plants. Well, what I got came from a small plant. There was no chemical, I mean, no uh, metals or anything it, in it. It's not the plant. It, it, yeah, it's, not, it's what people purchase and take home. You would not believe. So I just had my septic tank pumped, and the guy like said, you wouldn't believe what I find in septic tanks. <laughs> Come on, tell me. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I put so, it on my hay ground all the time, but I never yeah, did use it on no garden or nothing. And <laughs> stick with that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Any more questions? I'm done. All right. Thanks, Thanks Tom. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Tom, and thanks for making the trip. Um, he has come to Cabell County before, and we're going to Boone County later this month. Um, I wanted to let everybody know that the Conservation District provides a service uh, for soil testing. If you'll take a soil test, and you'll take it according to how WVU's website tells you, they'll mail it in to, for you for free. We'll help you fill out the form. So there's really no excuse not to take one, because we're going to mail it in for you. If you want to get one of these tests that they run, hey, give me a couple bucks, I'll write a check. I don't care, I've written a lot of checks to WVU. So, um, We'll do whatever we can to get you to take those soil samples. Additionally, we do have the kits for you to sample compost, which I didn't think about, John, what, before you did yours. But we do have the kits, um, and unless you guys overload me, I'm okay with sending them in on our dime. It doesn't bother me whatsoever. So I just want to let you know that that's available. Additionally, and I'm only putting this out to people I trust, but I have uh, extra soil probes. Now, I do think if you have a high tunnel, you should own your own. Okay, but if you don't want to and you think, well, is it really worth it, borrow mine once and you'll buy your own. So um, please take advantage of those services that the district is providing. Um, I know that form can be a little overwhelming, so we'd be more than happy to sit at our computer and fill it out for you. And I have full staff, even though they're not here today, they got exposed to COVID, so you're welcome. They're not here. But um, anyway, they, they will help you out. Um, the next person I'm going to ask to talk, if he's ready, is I have um, the forester from Lincoln County here. You know, a lot of people have land on their property that's forested and that's the back 40 and they don't really think about it. So um, David has uh, graciously come to our high tunnel field bay that has nothing to do with forestry, but he's going to let you know what kind of services he can provide. We also have cost assistance programs for forest, uh, forest practices as well as plans. So, anyway, David, I'll just hand it over to you. How y'all doing today? Yeah. Some of y'all for the first time. I recognize a couple of faces, but I'd like to introduce myself. My name's David Turnseed. I'm the Lincoln County Service Forester. Been in Forestry since 92. Uh, so, I've got a little bit of background. Uh, and like I said, we people see a bit of change in our agency. I kind of like to explain why these people see less of us. Is, we're now we're doing fire, logging, landowner assistance, and timber. So really thin is just one man doing it all. But I'm a forester. I love to concentrate on what NRCS does, the management plans. Uh, and I think are really important in Lincoln. Uh, as a fire forester, I find it myself uh, our four south of 64 have been burnt, mismanaged. <laughs> what's happening is due to all that mismanagement of our forest, fires are becoming an issue. The last fire I had was 31 acres, but I ended up cutting down 42 trees that were on fire because it's a doty forest. And that falls back to lack of manpower. So we're backing up, figuring out how we're fighting fire. It's changing. I mean, we're adding acres. But the unhealthy forest is a forest for what I like to solve. The NRCS is the best tool to do that. They have all the cost share assistance programs. Uh, Division Forestry, we do do uh, forest land management programs. Uh, there are some you know, good things for that. You'll get a 10-year tax break. Talk to your, your county asset for about that. Uh, but we'll walk through your forest and get the land out and see what your objectives are for your property. <laughs> and then walk your forest and try to make the two match. So you'll end up with a plan, you know, guide it through if you want, you know, timber stand improvement. Like, well, we'll give you good, precise knowledge of how to do that. Um, we'll look at soil type for different things we want to do. But there again, we kind of just gloss over a lot of it. We give you want to get dig deeper, contact NRCS. That's mainly what we do. Uh, but while I'm here, anybody got any questions? Uh, every landowner does. Seems like we've got, like said, we've got issues. And there's, I can't walk a stand of course down here that, through my eyes, needs to be replenished. Uh, fires, not such an issue as it used to be. The, the coal industry is down. Things have changed, and a lot of Lincoln County power lines have been moved. So the old doty fires that we used to have are coming back. But now we've got acres and acres and acres of just mismanaged back timberland south of 64. So that's why I like to push as a forester because. If I got a healthy forest, then I'm not going to have that bad of fire. First off, so that's what I see when I walk the bottom of property. Um, 
Uh, anybody got any questions? Yes, ma'am. How does some of this tree cutting affect that flooding in Huntington region? Not a, not a lot. Not a lot. Um, trees do soak up quite a lot of water, but any forest is kind of like any other piece of property. Whenever you do open one up, Trees naturally come back in, and in most generally regeneration, you take one plant out, you'll get 50 back. Where they make it all the way to, you know, to be dominant in the stand is something else. So generally, unless it's like a clear cut, you know, then you don't really have that much more. But sadly, there again, sometimes a clear cut is needed due to mismanaged forest. It's to the point where it takes 100 years to let it naturally do it. But if you come in with mechanical method, we can kind of speed the process up. Um, and that's why in logging, a lot of our logging requirements were started through the Federal Clean Water Act. So a lot of the way we would have loggers build roads and put water bars in, or for that soil sort of road. But it does add a lot, but it doesn't really add much more until you do something to compact the soil. If you compact the soil, then you kind of make a hard pan, where it takes more water a little bit harder to get through. There. So uh, good logging job, a clear cut. You'll get a little extra runoff, but if you look at it, it's mainly just because it comes off the of logging roads. Maybe there weren't enough water bars, maybe they weren't put in right. But there's usually a reason why there's kind of a flood off in there. David, as a whole, is the forestry department encouraging maple farming? Yeah, we do. NRCS has a programs for that. Anything you can do as landowners to make money off your properties, we're all behind that to help you guys do that. Um, and there's other species, and you, you've been into that, you see. Uh, maybe there needs to be more promotion to it, because on the other side, on the honeybee, you know, as a forester, I see a lot of things we ought to be focused on for, you know, pollination and everything else. Uh, there is some push for that. that. Now, whether there's anybody else that's going to jump on for extra funding programs, as a forcer standpoint, we just follow what these guys want to do. And your objectives. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's, he's going to draw up a plan based on what you want to do with your property. Okay. Yeah. Because if you just want wildlife, then he can help you figure out what's the better things to do for wildlife. Yeah, but if you want to start a maple farm, then I come out there. There's certain species you can fill in. I was reading, well, timber theft got me reading about black walnut and stuff. Black walnut syrup was even coming on as well. Four hundred dollars a gallon. Exactly. Um, and we can help you with that. Um, you know, a lot of landowners need help maybe just identifying the species they want to keep because sugar maple has your best sugar content. Anytime you cross in red maples or anything else that is used to it, it doesn't have the same water content. So that adds something to the honey you know, you've got to provide into that. Um, but yeah, we do, you know, we come out, we will, you know, set you up, you know, help design one, set one out. It's pretty work intensive sometimes. It can be pretty work intensive. Uh, especially Another one is sycamore. Don't want to cut down your sycamores because most of them are along the river and they're keeping our river banks in. But you can make syrup from that. It's like butterscotch. It's very good. My favorite. And it's expensive if you mix it with maple. Um, I did six more this year. We have an experiment going on with it, a two-year grant, and it looks very promising. Very promising. It's good. We do got the sickle. As I call them earth bones as a forester. I came out of industry, and kind of industry takes a different look on some species sometimes. But yeah, just, you drive around in the wintertime, look over the mountain, just earth bones. Kind of all I saw. <laughs> yeah, we can help with that assistance as well. <coughs> like I say, just let us know, talk to NRCS. They're the best people. Our staffing level's got to the point where our, it's hard to even just stay afloat. So I get these calls. I'm trying to find a fast way where if I'm walking a property with a landowner and I'm figuring what you want, a lot of times I can map it, maybe take a few plots while I'm there, then hand the information over to NRCS and save a lot. Um, and that's what we're trying to get down to. Um, and it's, it's working. Uh, but we do got a great program. Just keep in mind, bear with the state because of manpower. I've got a landowner now for like two years on uh, one project. Um, and maybe I need to give more to consultants. Or we need definitely more consultants in the area. Uh, but yeah, we yeah, we help you with that. Uh, like I say, insect disease, 
if you want to promote a certain species over another, every species out there kind of regenerates separately, different. Oak will regenerate its own way, but sugar maple needs what it needs to regenerate. Every species is kind of different. So as a forester, we just look at the whole picture combined in this case. What does it take to make this species regenerate? But yeah, I love doing that kind of stuff. What do you look for in a uh, for a forest that you would you say is generally healthy or, or unhealthy? What what are your main things that you look on that like for a property that hasn't been um, you know exposed to fire or, or anything? Native like plants. Just native plants. Every time I if I walk in the holler and I'm seeing those native plants and I'm convinced people say I'm crazy, but I'm convinced I can eat. I can, you can hear a healthy forest. I'm convinced. I mean, you can, you, you feel it. Um, but when I'm in those situations, I look around, okay, what vegetation I got around me? Nine out of ten times, it's not been burnt. Uh, logging isn't really such an effect if it happened a long time ago. It will heal itself. But fire in how it was used through the years. You walk some properties where it might have been managed for one thing. One guy just every time he went and got a species to sell for long, he got the best thing he could sell off the property. But when I walk into a healthy forest and I look around, I've got native species around. Me. There's nothing evasive coming around. And that's why I love to push the native grasses and species of the state. Because that's what we need. Forestry wise, all our evasives come from out of somewhere else. But that's where I've, I notice you'll see ferns growing. Um, there's indicator species that you just, but yeah, you just, you, you look around, you'll just see more native species around, the ferns and stuff. And that's, like I say, there's no damage, no fire damage. Uh, it's all about past land use. With the invasive trees, um, do you sort of just recommend getting in and cutting those out? You, well, it depends on the species. Okay. If you go in, say, with a beach. If I go in and just cut a beach off a stump, I won't get 50 back. But if I go in and girdle that beach and then spray it, you know, it's all in how you treat that. Uh, tree heaven is another different one. It's all in how you get rid of that species. Because, yeah, we all think you can cut it and it's gone. But there's, like I said, there's species out there. You cut one, you'll get 50 back. So it all depends on what species you're trying to get rid of. Is that the best way to do it? And most of what I'm finding is the thin bark species are the ones that usually need basal injection. Those all seem to be all around your maples, tree heavens. If it's a thin bark species, that's usually one you're going to have to girdle, spray, do something, or basil tree. Your thick bark species, and you can cut off a stump and they won't come back generally. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Well, I, yeah, I've been kind of experimenting, and these guys have more knowledge than I've got. Just the landowners I've worked through the years, what I've seen that works best is your first treatment early in the fall when the sap starts reversing, coming back down to the roots of the plant. That's how the plant keeps enough to survive through the winter. You treat it once in the early fall, you know, get it coming down into the plant. Hit it just as it starts to emerge in the spring, and then maybe one in the summer treatment. That's what I'm seeing being the best long term. Why are you treating them? Uh, well, there's different things. You've got guys using different things. I don't keep them all on mine. I'm not allowed to get herbicide work. Yeah, that's another thing we got to look at from agencies. Uh, I hear Remedy works pretty good. Evan, can, Evan is the expert on chemicals. So. Remedy and diesel fuel or hydrate mineral. <laughs> yeah, and Evan and I both uh, Remedy mixed with diesel fuel. That allows the diesel fuel allow that Remedy to go penetrate the car. We, we've been uh, practicing this at our own places every... Yeah. Actually, we're doing it in the wintertime. You know, you think in the winter, like right now, like the bugs and the ticks, and I'm not into yeah. that. So if we've been hitting them in like January or February yeah. and doing a basil bark treatment. We spray every single stem. Now, I'm not going to tell you that this is yeah. uh, an easy task because I found out I can't carry four gallons very easily on a hillside. <laughs> But, um, you know, it works real well, doesn't it, I mean, We actually have, we're trying to get some data ourselves yeah. and hopefully do a pasture walk field day where we and demonstrate this. If you're this. getting aggravated now, seeing it, and you go out to the side, I'm going to chop it tomorrow, make sure you paint that stump right away within like an hour. 
Because if not, that stuff will heal over. It will come back with a vengeance twice as thick as before. Yeah. I, I learned that year. I have not found a lot of success of just foliar spraying. Yeah. It's it's too tough for that. What do you got, David? Uh, I took a forestry class at Kim, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, and they said uh, <coughs> crossbow, and it goes to the roof and kills the roof. Yeah, so anytime you want to spray something, get a hold of like an extension agent, a forester. Um, those people have to keep uh, continuing education, and so they're more up on what currently is available and what's currently working. Is that correct? Yeah, I will say crossbow is what I've seen people using a lot lately. It does work, um, but it's a repeated treatment. Nothing's going to be, especially on them all. If you're looking for two years, the animal's trying to get rid of <laughs> but what I've seen the farmers trying, like I say, do starting in the fall, coming out in spring and summer, runs into two years, but they seem to be handling the problem better than you can't mow it down. I've just got a few. There's a few. There's a few. They will, but they'll come back. What, goats? Yeah, goats, the goats will eat them, but you've got a high stocking density to control that with goats. Yeah, so um, if you have invasive species on your farm, or if you, you know, can work with uh, David, he can give you a real quick plan to do an equip contract, which is the program that we have that, uh, I shouldn't say equip because of all these acronyms, but we have a program uh, that will give you some cost assistance to do some of this invasive species work. If you want a full forest stewardship plan and David doesn't have time or your county forester doesn't have time, NRCS does have a program where you hire a private consultant and then we reimburse you for the cost of that. So either way, um, those two things are available. So I think David um, coming here and um, you know if you need his phone number, we've got it. We know his cell phone number, we know how to get in touch with him and he is very responsive so I appreciate that. Um, Next speaker here um, is another uh, topic that I, I'm truly um, interested in, uh, is the salts and high tunnels. The Conservation District had a program this past year where we actually paid some of you all to take the plastic off, um, and it was pretty successful. I'd like to talk to Jody more about it. We don't have all our data back yet. But, um, you know, when we started building high tunnels, uh, we didn't really know what we were doing. We just built them. We just kept building them. And... Uh, now we have 92 of them, um, so we have 92 and we've spent almost a million dollars in this district. So we're learning a lot about what happens after you build a high tunnel. So <laughs> some good, some bad. So I'm going to hand this off to Jody. I listened to his talk on a continuing education day and I thought it was a really interesting topic for you guys. And so I'm really glad he's able to make the trip. Thank you, Jody. All right, thank you, Corinne. Um, so my name is Jody Carpenter. I'm an Ag and Natural Resource Agent. Um, I'm actually in Barber and Randolph County, so about three hours northeast of here. So it was a it was a trek. I, I carpooled with Tom. Now. Uh, we spent the night in Charleston because uh, it was going to be a, a long morning if we did. Um, it's my first time in the southern part of the state. That's hard. Well, on this side. Uh, so it's good to drive through. We took the scenic route. We 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 went a wrong turn. I didn't tell Tom that. I just I just figured you know let him think I know where I'm going. Uh, but we went through Boone County and back into Lincoln County. So it's pretty cool. Um, it's a lot different down here. Um, as he said, um, a lot of catalpa trees. We don't see that where I'm from. Uh, my grandparents had a big one in their yard, but to see one in the forest. You don't um, up, up in my part of the state. So uh, today, what I'm going to talk about is soluble soluble salts, um, especially in the high tunnel. So before I get started, how many of you folks have a high tunnel? A lot of folks, um, and, and some folks probably grow field crops uh, just in an in-ground garden uh, with no structure over it. I would assume, right? Okay, so you guys. Are, are not in this conversation. You guys are pretty good on soluble salts. Um, and we'll get into the reasons behind why that is uh, later. Um, but but and, and a lot of you composted, uh, which was, was pretty good to see. Um, but that can also lead to some soluble salt issues as well. 
So before you know, I get started, and I'll move so I don't fall over that cord. Um, so can anybody tell me what soluble salts are? Just raise your hand. What is a salt? Anybody know? What's a salt? Yeah, so it's just a, a compound. It's an elemental compound. Uh, it's an ion, so it's a charged particle. Um, so if we think about nu nutrients in the soil. So Tom said uh, nutrients are a good thing, but they can be too much of a good thing, right? So when we get the nutrients in the soil to a level that that they're free nutrients, so they're no longer bound to the soil particles, um, that's when they become an issue. That's when we start to see some yield damage and some crop damage in that high tunnel. So with you all that have high tunnels, have you been in, into production more than two, three years? Yeah. So usually we don't see a soluble salt issue until we get into about you know about the third, fourth year of high tonal production, uh, just because it's a it's a cumulative effect. So soluble salts, as I said, they're excess or free nutrients, um, and we can get those into our high tunnel in a plethora of, of ways. So you know fertilizer, fertilizer uses they you know the carrier for the nutrients is is a salt, right? Um, herbicides, insecticides, that has a salt component as well. Um, compost, uh, so if I use, uh, you know, manure, livestock manure that's not composted at least a few years and have, you know, has had some rain events to leach some of those soluble salts out, um, if I introduce that into my high tunnel, um, those levels get to a point to where we start seeing issues. Um, and irrigation water. So, I, you know, I don't know how you all irrigate your high tunnels, whether that's through a municip uh, like a municipality source, um, or if it's from a well, or if you draw from a creek. I don't know if that's allowed. Okay. So, um, it, you know, if, if we think about a water source from a, a, a municipality, uh, we have a lot of sodium, a lot of chlorine, um, and those are... You know, sodium chloride, right? That's table salt. That's what you all eat on everything, right? I got to watch my content because I have high blood pressure and I don't want to kill over one of these days. Uh, but chlorine, uh, sodium, uh, magnesium, potassium, uh, nitrate. So it all depends on the <coughs> if it's to that free level. Uh, so when I say free level, depending on... Well, if we think about the soil underneath of us, it's made up of what? Does anybody know? Sand, clay, silt, as organic matter. So if we think about that organic matter fraction and that clay fraction, um, those have what we call cation exchange capacities. So they are um, charged particles of soil that hold on to opposite charges of nutrients. So they can only hold a, 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 a limited amount of nutrients. So whatever extra is left, those are the issues that we run into. So why are they an issue in hot tunnels? So if we think about, uh, you know, in that hot tunnel, how is that any different than an in-ground garden? Anybody know? We don't have the water to flush it down. Yeah, good job. Yes, sir. So it's a very controlled environment. So we're, we are controlling the, the temperature, we're controlling the humidity, we're controlling the water. Um, so, you know, we don't have rain events, we don't have hail, we don't have snowfall to, to leach the excess nutrients out of the rooting zone. Um, so we have to be careful on, on letting, letting those get to a level where they are harmful, okay? So if you look in your packets, um, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna read it to you, but in the uh, there's a, 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 a fact sheet in there called salinity management in high tunnels, um, and this is a relatively new concept because as Corinne mentioned, you know we just started putting up high tunnels, not knowing that you know we could eventually create a system that that could cause a problem. So if you look in, in this uh, this publication. 
we can list or we can categorize crops based on their their solute or their uh, salinity tolerance. So those crops can be very tolerant of salts. So like you know beets, um, asparagus, uh, artichokes are very tolerant. And then that crop can also be very sensitive. So beans, um, carrots, strawberries are very sensitive. So if we think about uh, crop or, or what that crop damage looks like uh, when we have a high salt content in the soil, we're going to see very limited germination. Uh, we're going to see stunted growth on what germination we have. Uh, but especially in our, our greens, our, our lettuce crops, our spinach, um, we can start to see some, some burning effects on the edges of those older leaves. Um, and all that is, is uh, if we think about salt, does salt like water? What do you think, what do you think the reaction between salt and water is going to be? Does salt repel water or does salt, salt, you know, uh, it dissolves in water, so it, it, it sucks up water, right? So that water, so if we think about an osmotic pressure, and I'm probably getting too technical, um, but if we think, we think about that soil as a medium, um, and it has a certain salt concentration, we put a plant in the, in the soil that has a low salt concentration, we have a high salt environment and a low salt environment. So the water is going to flow to where that salt is. So if we have a high salt environment, that's going to suck up the water. That's going to uh, make the water retention of that plant a lot less. Uh, and that's going to give us uh, root damage, uh, root burn. Um, that's also going to you know, manifest itself in leaf burn on those older leaves, especially in your lettuces, um, in your spinach, uh, your greens. Okay? So, how can I, how can I find out if I have a high EC or a high electroconductivity in my soil? Okay, and we call it electrical conductivity because uh, that's kind of synonymous with uh, soluble salts. So what they do in the lab is they mix water um, and, and soil to a, a, a certain ratio, and they make a paste, and they run a electrical current through it. Um, the amount of electrical current that runs through that sample is, is linear to the soluble salt content of that soil. Okay? Um, so we can make a recommendation on that uh, soil sample if you send it in and you pay $3 to get that EC uh, test ran. It'll come back on the, the same form that gives you every, all your pH and your fertility recommendations on it. Um, so you look at that number, and based on that fact sheet, uh, we have you know we have a table. Um, you pick your you you see, hey, my crop is tomatoes. Uh, it has a threshold of 1.5. So at that threshold, anything above it, I start to get yield damage. Uh, I don't want to get above the threshold for my crop. So if I'm a high tunnel producer and I'm growing strawberries, and I send in a, a soil sample, and my EC test comes back as being a, uh, well, I'll give you this example. So in Upshur County, we had a hot tunnel producer growing strawberries. Um, strawberries are the most sensitive crop to salts. Uh, that threshold is 0 0.7. Uh, so that's Desi Simons per um, meter of soil. Uh, you don't need to worry about that, just worry about 0 0.7. So he sent in his uh, EC sample to the university, had that test ran. It came back, his EC was 12.1. Do you think he's able to grow strawberries? <laughs> he is not. So, you know, two years prior to that, we had no idea what soluble salts were. You know, he would plant strawberries year after year, and they were just, they were dying. We didn't know why. But we found out <laughs> yeah, they were dying. So um, when you all send in that sample, and I would definitely uh, get with your conservation district to take advantage of, of getting that mailed in, um, and even you know write them, give them some cash. They write a check. It's a simple test for you to do uh, to minimize how much crop damage you will see. Uh, because we want to maximize our yields. You know that's not a, a cheap structure to put up. 
I want to get as much yield out of that structure as I can, right? Uh, if I'm sharing it with neighbors, if I'm selling it wholesale, retail, uh, farmers markets, whatever, I want to get the most bang for my buck, okay? So what what can you do if um, if that, that level is above threshold? Um, so we did a research project a couple, uh, well, two years ago now, um, at a farm up in Barger County with a couple of different high tunnels, um, and we tested out, tested out a couple different crops that he was growing, uh, pulled an initial EC sample out of those tunnels uh, to kind of gauge where he was, um, and if he, if he needed to correct a problem, uh, we could do that. So we utilized an equation from the USDA Salinity uh, Center out in California. Um, so with that equation, they take um, you know the initial C EC uh, where I want to get to, the amount or the inches of soil that I want to reclaim. So in this study, we use three inches of, so of soil. Um, average, that's about the rooting depth for most high tunnel crops. Um, you can go a little more if you want to, uh, that's up to you. Uh, but also in that equation, uh, the, the most important part is what we call a K factor. So that's a factor for soil texture. So if you remember, um, back to the clay particles having that, that CEC or that cation exchange capacity. So they're, they're able to hold on nutrients a lot better than sand, right? Sand flushes everything through. Um, so we use that K factor, that it's a constant, so whatever you're at, and here in this part of the state, uh, you're going to use that, that fine textured soil constant, which is a 0 0.3, um, and we plug that into an equation, and it gives us how much water, or how many inches of water we need to apply to that tunnel in order to push those excess salts out of the rooting zone, okay? So the equation is in that handout. Um, but I also made a simple version on an Excel spreadsheet. Um, it's locked, so you only need to put in a, um, an, what EC you get back on that test and what you want to get to. Um, and I can send that to anybody that wants that. Um, I'll share it with, uh, with Evan, and he'll send that out to you all. Um, so all you got to do, and, and they're highlighted, so if it's highlighted yellow, you input that number. Um, and there's another tab that gives you a rate. Okay, so it gives you two rates. One rate is inches of water for fine textured soil. So that's going to be our, our clay loams, our sandy clay loams, all of that good stuff. Okay? Um, the other uh, rate is going to be for our coarse textured soil. So that's going to be our sandy loams, um, our fine sandy loams, all of those good stuff. But we don't have to worry about that because we don't have <coughs> hot sandy soil. Okay? Good point. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, again, that depends your water, you know, what kind of water source you're using. Okay? Um, another question that I get a lot is, um, if I put that many inches of, of water in my tunnel, is that going to flush all of my available, you know, nutrients uh, for crop growth? Is that, that going to flush those out? Um, so the answer is no. So I'm, I'm just flushing out or leaching uh, the free fraction of those nutrients. Um, so as I said, organic matter um, and, and clay particles, because they are a charged soil particle, they're going to hold on to those plant nutrients. So like uh, Dr. Lidl said, did I say that right? Good deal. Um, so as you mentioned with cover crops, if I can... Can, whatever I can use to increase my soil organic matter, that's going to increase my cation exchange capacity. So that's going to, going to make my soil um, a lot uh, indicative of holding on to some of those nutrients um, and, and decrease the amount of, of salt damage that I see. Okay? All right, so that's a, a quick spiel. Um, about that, um, it's a it's a, a relatively cheap um, test to run. I would recommend if you're getting a couple crops out of that high tunnel, um, just because we have a high degree of, of sensitivity in crops, um, test that EC between your or at, at the crop um, while you're, you're before you harvest it. 
Um, and then when you take that crop out, before you put the next crop in, if you need to make an adjustment, um, that's when you need to do that, okay? You don't want to flood the high tunnel uh, while you have crop growing. Uh, that adds a whole other round of factors that we won't, we won't get into. Um, but again, you know, that time between uh, pulling tomatoes out and putting cabbage in or broccoli in, that's the time that you want to make that, uh, that change, okay? So are there any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, so, um, you know, you can, uh, if, if you have a, a season that you don't have anything growing, you can remove that uh, plastic and let the natural rainfall just leach out the, the salts themselves. Um, but if you, if you have a very strict um, crop rotation going, uh, the time that you don't have anything growing, that's when you can apply that water um, and reach that effect uh, before you put that crop in. Okay. So if I have a, if my, if 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 I take an EC sample and it's, uh, let's go with 1.8, and I'm putting a, a crop of peppers in there that have a threshold of 1.5. I need to get that down below 1.5 before I put those peppers in, so I don't get any yield damage. I can get the maximum yield off of that pepper crop that I can. All right. Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean that's an option. If you have that stream, um, I mean I don't I don't know of any local laws where I'm from as far as pulling that water out and putting on that hot tunnel. Um, so that's I mean that's just fine. Um, and you can use a um, if you have an overhead irrigation system in that hot tunnel, um, just put you out some rain gauges and, and kind of track how many inches you're applying. Um, it, it comes a little difficult if all you have, if, if all of you, you have available is drip line. Um, so then you have to calculate how many gallons do I need to push into that hot tunnel in order to, to achieve the result that I want. Um, and that's, that's a little more complicated with math, but I mean, nothing that, that we won't sit down and, and help you with. Yes, sir. And let it leach out, yeah. So that's an option, um, and then that's a good point. So the, the man in Upshur County um, that I referred to as having, you know, trying to grow strawberries, his EC was 12.1. That, that was a lot, you know, we put that in the, the calculator, um, and that was a whole heck of a lot of water in that hot tub. So what he did is he just removed, you know, the top six inches of soil. Uh, he had a, a pile of compost, you know, it's been composted for well over three years. So he just took that, put that in the hot tub. Um, so once that, that's sitting outside for, I would say, at least two years, um, let the rain, let the, walk, the, the, the snowfall have, have an effect uh, <coughs> on the salts in that compost, uh, the better. So if you put um, fresh manure in a hot tunnel, um, you not only have the salts, but you have a whole, you know, you have a, a whole bunch of problems. Okay? You, you're looking at fertilizer burn, you're looking at... Um, excessive uh, heat generation and all that. Compost? I'm not sure. <coughs> I'm not sure on that either. I know that there are some producers that do get it. Um, so maybe we're going to have a round table next, so maybe that would be a good question. I think John McDowell uses some mushroom compost. And I do know that, so there's another producer in Upshur County that gets a lot of compost from Charleston. Okay. Um, so it's like, you know, something with the city. I, I'm not sure, but I can find that out. And it's, it's, I think it's a capital conservation district. It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's out at Camp Berkeley Table. They have that. Yeah, I think you just take your truck out and yeah. fill it up. Okay.
Yeah. I would think removing the soil would probably be your worst case scenario. So definitely, yeah. Especially when the test is only three dollars. Uh, another thing, Rick. Um, when you sell your products on the market, if someone does that, you may have to consider food security laws with using streams. So that's why we always kind of walk away from <coughs> irrigating the streams if at all possible. Yeah, and, and targeting between those crop cycles, well, I mean, you, you shouldn't have any issues with that. I would recommend it, yes. Um, so we're going to apply all of the, you know, usually it's only a couple inches of water to the, the uniform, you know, get a uniform application to that high tunnel. Um, because the problem when you, you don't get enough and you put actively growing plants in, um, then you kind of change the overall base saturation, um, cation exchange capacity, all that good stuff of the soil. Um, so your recommendation it, it, it won't work if you have actively grown plants in the hot tunnel. Uh, we found that out with one of the one of the tunnels in the study. Uh, just because it had, we weren't quite there yet, uh, but he needed to put those crops in. Um, so we just let it go, and, and you kind of change what crop you put in um, as to kind of your management protocol. If, if, if when you can get that down, or how low you can get that EC down. I think a lot of the tunnels, especially um, in our district, so we did this, you know, little study where we removed the plastic. The people that were involved in that program, their practice has already been past the, pra the lifespan of that plastic. You know, the plastic only lasts so long. So if you're starting to have the salt issues, I really think, you know, you need to replace it anyway. Take it off. Let it rest. I mean, let it rest in the middle of the summer when you don't need the heat. Um, there's a lot of different options out there in addition to this flooding, which I thought the flooding uh, option was pretty pretty cool, you know, as well, especially if you have really super high. Now, the soil test that I have had the results from so far, I had some that were up at 1.5 and over 1, and then the one the results after the plastic is in the room is gone down to like 1 zero. So it, it really, it really worked. But it is a little bit expensive. Like I said, you gotta replace that plastic sometimes. So. Leave it off for a while. Give it a rest. <laughs> Anybody have any more questions for Jody? He's here. I'm hoping he's going to eat with us. Hopefully. I heard it was going to be good. Home cooking for George. Well, he'll be around. Um, thank you, Jody. Thank you. Very good.